Hello, everyone, and welcome to Genius Wednesdays brought to you by Coin Genius and the illustrious folks on Team Genius. Uh, we're joined today, as always, by Mr. Steve Kwan. Uh, we also have CEO Jeremy Bourne, uh, Quant uh, analyst uh, uh, Tim Hesselsweet, um, our CRO uh, Tim Bogert, our advisor Oz Sultan, uh, and our new addition to the family, uh, mining expert Dustin Minch. Uh, so we will kick it off today with our traditional uh, market analysis, and then we will also have a new segment uh, where we review the mining data called Hash It Out. With that, I will turn it over to Mr. Steve Kwan. Hi, thank you, Christina. Good morning. I'm going to share the entire screen right now and just kind of move through everything in fairly short order. Can everyone see this? Top line says CG January 22nd. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, I'll start with what I look at as the market that everyone's watching. S&P, I mean, whether you think it's over or undervalued, I don't step in front of runaway trains. So there it is, pretty much new high after new high. It maybe it's overvalued, maybe a put strategy or short call. Spread strategy might be entertaining, but you know, you're you're betting against the grain. The Nasdaq is even a sharper angle upwards, as you can see. Now we'll move to something that people may not want to hear as much, but I, I wanna bring this up because this was I guess in my mind, it's one of the ultimate drivers always. So these are Euro dollars. And for those that aren't familiar, a, a quick way to kind of guesstimate what LIBOR is, is 100 minus the Euro dollar price. So as you can see in the beginning of January, it kind of had a definitely a top out. Now, looking back further of why this is important here oh, oops i think i might have made two of the same okay that one's the same that was a one month chart but here's a little further out now here's the one where it may be slightly concerning for those that are extremely bullish bitcoin and i say bitcoin specifically because here's euro dollars over the past year and you've heard me say this as far back as when i met christina a year ago rates moving down bitcoin moving up rates flattening now watch here's your one year bitcoin see not a perfect correlation and obviously there's many other moving parts in the bitcoin market and i'm not talking about all of blockchain or all the project this is specifically bitcoin and i've been fairly adamant for about three months that moving out of bitcoin and into other cryptocurrencies blockchain projects whether small cap of a million dollars to five million or mega cap i.e the top 10 quote unquote and you'll see that I've said it publicly again and again, and it's been right. I didn't say it a year ago. So here, we'll move on. So here you can see Bitcoin over the past three months. Sure, it's kind of an exciting range. When we get under 7,000, the Twitter sphere tell. You know, you see that it's going to zero. I'm not one of those people. Gets above 9,000, and the next thing I hear is, oh, it's going to 20,000. I'll say this again and again. Markets don't always have to be up or down. They can consolidate for extended periods of time. I could show you charts of the equity markets from basically 2000 to about 2008 where there was eight years of consolidation i don't believe that that's the case in a young investment class uh slash industry such as blockchain but again 
if it's only buying Bitcoin, it's like buying diamonds or gold. If you're buying other things, you're buying the platinums and silvers and so on. And if you're buying organizations with visible CEOs, CFOs, developers, etc., you're buying, I guess in my mind, something like a miner in metals or a driller or a refiner in oil where you're buying the product, but you're also buying that organization. So Bitcoin, pretty much dead center of the range, not much excitement in my opinion. Over the past month, we can see 7,000 and 9,000 fall back. Again, I don't know. I'm not going to make a price prediction there, but let's move to what's actually changed. So these are all relative because with Bitcoin being 65% of the market, Bitcoin up, most of people's portfolios generally are up this year because, like I said, it's 65% of your top line predictions. So whether you're long Dogecoin, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, anything, it's it's still heavily weighted towards Bitcoin's US dollar price. So what happened over the past three months? Well, we can see flattened out over the summer and now Bitcoin Cash has risen 70 some percent in terms of Bitcoin. Now let's look at a shorter duration. Here was six months, kind of started to become interested in putting on a trade. And it was right around, gosh, I want to say WCC when the Coin Genius team met up, where I kind of was able to talk to people that are a lot smarter and wiser than me in specific blockchain projects and really got fairly adamant about moving from Bitcoin to other things. Here's Bitcoin Cash. Here's a shorter duration, three months one month i mean the one month chart looks a lot sharper but we'll move on now I, i'm showing bitcoin cash because hey, this is this is oz i just wanted to ask a quick question um yeah how did we how did we look data collection wise on the sv spike i'm sorry could you repeat us how did um how how were we poised in terms of like our data analytics for the SV spike, because SV spiked 104% in one day last week. I don't... So I can take that one. Though. Yeah, okay. I can take that one. So, Oz, that's part of the intelligence engine, and that requires hundreds of thousands of lines of code to predict it. And mm -hmm. we'll start um, next month in February with, like, percentage increase alerts. Um, but there has to be a bunch of intelligence that's built on top of that. Okay. Fine. And Oz, from my right now, right. Sorry, just to clarify, right now our intelligence um, engine is Steve Kwan's brain, where he looks at all of the data and then tells us what we have to program to be able to see those kind of alerts and those kind of transactions happen. Now I know, Oz, I, I haven't talked to you in a bit, but I know that some would be like, "Oh, well, wow, this is obvious," but. Christina or Jeremy could probably go back along the records or people I talked to in October where back here it didn't seem as interesting to start putting these spreads on, but I tend to just look for areas where things have gone down sharply and then if they can, you got to stop going down before you can go up and this was kind of that zone. So, and then specifically on Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, I'm not a huge trader or I actually think I might have like a two lot on right now, but I tend to look at kind of it in the mega cap world where there's about 10, the billion dollar plus market caps where I look at what's the strongest, what's not. And Bitcoin cash, I did position into, so not as good of a return, but still not complaining happier than I was three months ago. 
And again, here. So I'd like to add, Steve, before you move on from Bitcoin Cash, just for any of our new viewers, for Oz, for any of the folks um, on the phone here, uh, just to reiterate that uh, we have a, uh, so at Coin Genius, we look at each coin independently, um, but we also look at what it's tied to and keeping in mind that Bitcoin Cash and BSV are both uh, part of the Bitcoin fork family. Um, which accounts for about 90%. You see those correlations um, tied heavily. I'm really hoping in 2020 that those will start to split where Bitcoin Cash is seen as its own entity and BSV is seen as its own entity. Um, and Bitcoin uh, Satoshi Vision and the Craig Wright project has a lot of sentiment drivers around it. There's a lot of um, kind of drama in the industry right now around Craig Wright claiming that he's Satoshi and not a lot of people believe that. And there's a PR stunt. Um, but if the uh, event trigger happens where he's actually awarded and it becomes, you know, publicly accepted um, or at least tolerated that um, he's referred to as Satoshi, that becomes a sentiment driver. And that is where you start to see those spikes of like 104 um, percent. And there, it's starting to rumble already. I can kind of start to feel it happening. I think by April, you're going to see a lot of activity in both BCH and BSV. Um, but it's up to you to do your due diligence to uh, decide if those are projects that you want to be invested in and keep in mind you're investing in more than just the technology. So um, all of those factors come to play and all of those factors are things that Coin Genius is quantifying. Okay. And this, I actually didn't get time to totally add but along the lines of what we call the Bitcoin family of forks, the, the four hard forks, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, Bitcoin Gold, and Bitcoin Diamond, um, the, last, the last two are not as well known, but they're also both top 50 projects. And you can see here Bitcoin Diamond is still a $110 million market cap, ranked number 47. And... I'm not super familiar with it, but you can see right here along the same lines of the BCH and BSV surge. This was from 4,700 Satoshi to almost 9,400. So doubling in two days. And I'll move back to, this is kind of an on the fly show. Bitcoin Gold is ranked number 37, $187 million market cap. And we'll just show it in one month. And just in terms of Bitcoin, what do you know? Same surge, same day. 83,000 Satoshi to 200,000 Satoshi and... Steve, can I interrupt you just for the yeah. new viewers? Can you break down again what Satoshi is and so um, uh, folks can kind of follow along? Sure. Uh, a Bitcoin, if you say you have 100 million Satoshi, that's one Bitcoin. So if you have 100 million one Satoshi coins, you have one Bitcoin's worth of Bitcoin. If you have each 100 Satoshi, give or take, is about a penny. So 100 Satoshi interval at ten thousand dollars is worth one cent notionally when i start looking at sub 100 satoshi items they're not i guess they're they're not tangible in terms of people understanding so because you know saying 50 million of something is worth one bitcoin i guess it's easier for me to look at for instance here this this entity is 123,000 Satoshi. So I would just simply divide 100 million divided by 123,000. So it takes 813 Bitcoin gold to equal one Bitcoin roughly. And as we see, 1071 times 10.71 you get 8707 and you can see here I actually can't see here but um that's about the bitcoin price 8671 holy yeah so that we need that calculation like right now um i will assign that to i know exactly who i'll assign that to so steve can you actually so, do me a favor um the thing that we came up with internally at the vegas show uh the stack 
Could you yeah. explain that to folks on the phone and the people listening in as well, and then show that same calculation as it relates to stacks so they understand exactly why okay. we created that term? That'd be great. So measuring everything in U.S. dollars for pretty much every project is really not a fair calculation where if Bitcoin is up 100% in one year and it's 17,200, but every other market closed from Ethereum to whatever's the last coin on coin market cap, people would infer that the price of everything else doubled. Would it? Would it not? I don't know. Couldn't tell you. But Jeremy, myself, and Tim Bogert were just chatting in how over the WCC and trying to think of a metric, not U.S. dollars and not Bitcoin to measure everything. So we came up with something called stack or I guess we could give it a three letter term called STK where one would measure a stack would be one would be one a $100 bill. So it was, it would just be a static 100 instead of tether. You would just use a hundred. So Bitcoin would be 8,700 divided by 100. All of a sudden you just say Bitcoin is 87 stack. We go to Bitcoin gold and, or we go to Ethereum 168 and just go 168 divided by 100. So it's 1.6 instead of everything is right now. If I have point something of something, if I have 0.02 Christina or 0.23 Oz or 0.42 Jeremy or 0.15, that's not really a, an amount that people would understand, but. People seem to understand Tether, but in the U.S., I'm guessing that most of you, if you looked in your wallet, you probably have a 1, you probably have a 5, you probably have a 10, you probably have a 20, maybe a 50, maybe a 100. I think I have a $1,000 bill in my safe that's a collectible, but for all intents and purposes, there's different intervals. So when looking at a stack, it's just it's a static 100, and it makes things easier where bitcoin will still be the highest one as you can see right here it'll be 87 but you go to something like bitcoin satoshi vision instead of saying it's 0.04 bitcoin it's three stack litecoin is 0 0.05 0 0.5 stack it's it's just nominalizing tether on a larger scale since many of the mega caps especially as we can see are in the dollars you know we see tezos monero x ethereum classic dash etc 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 there's very few that are in small intervals and i guess ethereum and ripple or bitcoin cash and ripple is they're, they're just small percentages i can go into that later but let me just finish up on Kind of like the nuts and bolts so i think that interest rates should be watched very carefully by those really liking bitcoin because as interest rates in the us go up if others are not the dollar will get stronger and fortunately or unfortunately tether is still the most highly traded i guess currency peg BitShares Yuan, I think, has a $6 million market cap. So that might be something I could talk to someone I know at at a large uh, stable coin about maybe looking at something else. But if Euro dollars start heading down and rates start heading up, I would not be very bullish on Bitcoin. I could be wrong, but let me finish and what I say I would be bull more bullish on. Could I could I just interject one thing? Could you send me a yeah. couple bullet points via email on Stack? Um, because sure. I'm working on a medium piece for this, and a lot of this is kind of talking about how we change economic theorem over the course of the next couple of years, but a lot of this really kind of comes down to incentivize the businesses to understand this as opposed to academia, which because otherwise you get zero yield. 
Um, the other thing too is Christina, did you share uh, Sam's um, stablecoin uh, assessment with this group? I have not. No, we are we are way overloaded, and I know exactly when we'll dig into that. But I have not uh, stacked the team on that. Okay, then I'll shut up now. But yeah, if you could just send me some bullet points because I want to get an article. I, I, the whole idea is that like if we can start writing the narrative around this, we can eventually go back and be like, that was the start point, and this is how you need to understand the transformation in terms so of Oz, you getting actually, into this industry. I, I would love it if you could do a really quick 30-second summary for the team um, so that they don't have to dig through the entire document. Um, guys, essentially, uh, Sam's... Uh, it's an STO expertise on, on, or sorry, excuse me. It's um, stablecoin, uh, super deep dive, um, and it gets into the theory of of economics. So, Oz, if you want to take it from there and kind of paint the picture, that would be helpful. Yeah, the general gist is is, and this goes back to the ethos of you know, I think what you guys are doing is on the one side you've got the SEC looking at buckets of tokens, okay. And they're saying there's a utility token, there's a, a fungible token, and there's there's something perhaps that appreciates in value that's more like a commodity. Um, in looking at the stable coins, there's the perspective that these are all working more like a currency than a commodity. And there's a there's sort of a function of understanding. There's under there could be underlying utility. There could be underlying mechanisms that are also divergent from you know what is typically used standard by. Uh, a lot of the ICOs that that happened previously, so you could have a multi-token architecture, you could have a variety of other things. Um, so, in a nutshell, what she's done is just kind of given a guideline as to what the standards are for stable coins. Um, I'm happy to share that out with the entire group. I can just uh, attach that into a reply all um, to everyone on this on this meeting. But I, I'm just kind of thinking as we're getting these variegated forms of thought leadership coming into the market. It's important for us to kind of figure out how we collate, assess, and, and what we ingest and put into the engines and the algorithms, and, and what is just more of like the academic uh, treatises related there too, um, that you know we just have as frameworks. But I think what Sam has is, is, is pretty like germane to what's being done here. It's, it's pretty awesome, and it's incredibly in-depth. And um, with her permission, I'd like to be able to put it onto the website for anyone who wants to do, you know, really deep dive research. Um, but to Oz's point, <clears throat> there's a, a way of looking at all of these and, you know, Coin Genius is looking at thousands of different data points, but by categorizing these and by looking at their behavior, um, it allows for uh, legislation and adoption of uh, changing behavior when people can fully understand it. So, um, all in the uh, in the interest of educating and, and helping folks understand this very complex landscape. Um, okay, so Steve, I will turn it back over to you f to finish up uh, your presentation, and then we will start the roundtable of uh, market analysis. Oh, and a quick note, I guess specifically Oz and Christina. A friend of mine who I sat next to for about five years at a fun, he's one of the MDs or directors at True USD, and I, I don't know a ton about it, but I know they actually took in a dollar to issue every token, whereas you know Tether has uh, apparently not. But right. I can so invite him Steve, for a jump in. Yeah, oh. I'm going to jump in really quick just because, you know, for Genius Wednesdays, I want to keep it super on track. Um, okay. But we will dig into that. And um, I'd like to quantify some of those things, um, you know, so as we're doing our claiming platform um, where folks can actually say, you know, is it backed by a dollar? Is it backed by actual gold? There are other projects out there that are backed by actual diamonds and actual banks and by silver and actual banks. Um, and those those projects should be treated very differently than something that is hypothetical or or mined, right? That's There's just a, a lot to unpack there. Um, but let's go back to the market analysis here and um, and let's wrap up so we can get to the round table. Okay. Uh, so, uh, one, uh, Christina, sorry, sidebar, um, I texted her. She said, feel free to put it on the website. So I would perfect. just create, create a separate landing page um, and then figure out what you want to, you know, we could drive that traffic I will to. take care of it. Okay, I'll take care of it. All right, so Steve, back to you. Okay, so Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, obviously two of the major leaders. Now, point of reference, the next space I follow the most is Masternodes and Dash being the largest. 
you can see where this came from a year ago and it's had a nice bounce off the bottom and that's one year this is six months three months one month but i was taught this a long time ago 90 percent of most moves come in about 10 percent of the days of the year so one who gets involved here you may see no gain or no loss and that's why i'm very accepting of the fact that something doesn't have to go up or down but putting something on here where you're not really losing or making where you have these strong beliefs then you get paid here and you know waiting for the next idea so there's dash next one and once again i'll thank nick kearney i don't know if he's on but for pointing out some things to me in october about ethereum classic and this actually is the biggest gainer off the bottom in bitcoin terms as you can see it went from 450 to almost 14 or from 45,000 to 140,000 so almost a 3x return in bitcoin terms and it all happened first bounce flat flat and then like i said here january 6th to january 17th so there's your 10 days and there's your move moving on ethereum classic again ethereum classic again now the leaders which have been the laggards the old leaders e ethereum's flattening out so it's I guess worth a look, but this looks more range bound. Next, Ethereum on a shorter term basis, and then finally one month. Yes, you've had a nice move, but it needs to get over this 230 or 0.023 level in fairly short order to become really bullish, at least according to the methods I use. Here's Litecoin unique situation last year uh let me finish up shorter term that's come way 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 off but again consolidation on the low some bounce but needs to get really above 750,000 satoshi or 0.075 to get real legs but again here's a shorter term picture you know it's up 25 percent in bitcoin terms and all right i don't know if samson's on but ready for this one the project i believe the least in and think will have the most outflows is ripple and it was samson who pointed this out to me two weeks ago or three weeks ago that ripple labs they have a token called ripple they can do their business with they can rename anything so when you own ripple you actually don't own a piece of their business and where this is flattening out but i note all the other projects i've shown have had some bounce so that's a year here's six months here's three months here's one month so my closing statement is large caps I fall have all bounced significantly to very significantly misspelled, sorry. And special thanks to Samson for pointing this out. But when things are going up, if you're not, that's a red flag. If things can stabilize in a down market, those are things that I look at as bullish. And that's it. I can send this to any or all and i'll put it on slack or give it to christina yep. and jeremy send, send it on over and i'll make sure that it gets out and it'll be part of the content um for genius wednesday consumers as well okay um and so thanks for that steve i do have sure. a quick question and oz is on the line here um i believe was it ripple that was announced with the ibm network or was that stellar am i getting those two crossed oz that was so stellar has uh announced a partnership with ibm um, okay it's stellar and, not really but hold on there's 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 one other thing to add to that and so what ibm has been doing is typically in europe these countries will borrow like hundreds of millions of dollars overnight to pay like you know pension bills or this that or you know payroll sometimes um 
what they're looking to do is to, to change cross-border payments into Stellar on Hyperledger. Gotcha. So, so I can I can add to that as well. You know how I think somebody even mentioned this before. They say you know uh, trade the rumor, sell the news. Um, there's a current rumor that people are assuming that people in um, the IBM organization are relying on XRP secretly versus Stellar. Uh, Stellar and IBM have announced partnership and have been working together for the last couple of years. Uh, so that's not new news. It's really the XRP news. And, you know, this notion that they might be relying more so on XRP, um, you know, as that medium of exchange versus Stellar. So and let me, that's let me, really the case, then, then maybe let me, add, let me add to that. So here's where I think it's going. I think it's going to be Stellar on the back end for interbank transactions all the way f- through wires to T2. So T2 is typically outside of a wire. If I need to move a hundred million dollars from German, like from the the Bundesbank to you know the central bank of France, I would move it on T2. So what they're looking at doing is is not just transfer systems, but payment systems, and then charging in Stellar. On the front end, I think you're probably going to see XRP because if you look at some of the walleting situations out there, Santander Bank, Banco Popular, a lot of these other banks have already integrated XRP into their like into their wallet solution. It's not a wallet solution per se, but if I go into my bank app, XRP is integrated on Santander. So I personally see that there's a consumer play and then there's a, there's a play for institutions. Excellent. So I'm going to just uh, add to Q1 monitoring both um, Ripple and Stellar, and we'll just continue to track both of them. Um, Okay. So before we uh, pivot over to mining, um, I'd like to hear from Tim Hesselsweet um, around his view on the market analysis this week. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I think that the last thing that I touched on in late December was the tight um, Bitcoin trading range between 7,000 and 7,500. And we indicated that the break of, of that of that range would be crucial to the near-term out- outlook. Um, we, we broke to the upside. On January 10th, we actually came back down and retested that range. Um, and that was, I think, a really favorable buying opportunity for, for Bitcoin. Um, so I, I see the, the bulls um, and, and kind of quiet control here. Lovely. Um, I will just uh, jump. I'll jump on that as well. Just um, from our recent trip to uh, Miami uh, from the BTC conference, Um, you know, when I was getting to tell folks about Genius Wednesdays, uh oh, um, I I was basically, you know, kind of rattling things off, saying, you know, we we saw the consolidation. We called the parabolic low. We called the spike back up. We called Ethereum classic. We called BCH and the folks around me were like, take my money, take my money right now. Like we need these insights. We need to understand how everything is tied together um, and what's not tied together and be paying attention to all of that. So folks were very excited to have this kind of analysis and and have this available at their fingertips. Um, Really quickly. Uh, really quickly, uh, Tim, do you have anything else to add for market analysis this week? Kind of like Steve, I, I'm, I'm not going to say a lot, but I think I think that that's that's really the gist of um, of what's happening on the on the trading front. Um, many, lots more going on in terms of um, more peripheral coins and and large increases and decreases, but but that's that's the main. Uh, 20,000 foot view. Beautiful. All right. Well, uh, just in terms of uh, analysis, uh, let's turn it back over to the team. Uh, Jeremy? Yeah, sure. Um, really love the analysis by Steve. Thank you for doing that. Um, you know, this shows obviously everything in, you know, that's unfolding in front of our eyes. You know, you've been talking about a lot of specific themes and metrics over the past few months. I'd say, you know, you have a 98 plus percent accuracy rate in terms of, you know, you anticipating things happening and those coming to fruition. So that's great to see. 
um, relying more so and looking at the coin genius metrics and some of our indicators is really interesting. It's very telling in terms of what you can anticipate happening uh, in the future. Um, so, you know, continuously refining those is really important for us and, and very exciting, especially as you look at our website on the correlation side of things and seeing how tightly things are correlated and coupled. Um, it, it is really a very interesting exercise. So looking to expand that a little bit further and sending out notifications based on users requirements, which is really exciting. Um, with that said, if I'm looking at the market, uh, I think it's playing out just how, you know, we're all anticipating. Um, you know, there's not going to be too many tremendous moves up into the halving. Um, like I had predicted before, um, I see this as if I was a whale and I was trying to, you know, manipulate the market in any way possible um, to try to, you know, take as much money from retail investors as possible. I would slowly pump up the price um, and basically, you know, getting to the having uh, crush everybody's hopes and dreams by making sure that it doesn't go up as everybody anticipates uh, as a self-fulfilling prophecy as everybody's hypothecating around. Um, and when that happens, you know, there'll be probably a little bit of a lull and then slowly it'll rise when people least expect it. And then they can get the price at the lowest price possible so they can make the most amount of money. And then we're going to see a massive pump. That's what I'm anticipating happening. Uh, but then again, you know, um, this is an interesting cycle. There's a lot of key players. There's a lot of bots and automation happening in the industry. So a lot is out of human hands and we're getting closer to that of traditional equities where, you know, 75, 80% or more is automated trades. Um, so we're getting to that type of cycle. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Now, the one interesting thing, if you look at CoinDesk, they published an article about, you know, potential retail accumulation, right? And these are people that are probably assuming that the having is going to be a significant impact to the price of Bitcoin specifically. Uh, so they've been monitoring the addresses that hold at least one Bitcoin, which they translate that to a retail trader and not necessarily uh, a large trading house that might hold 10 or more. Um, so that growth for that key on-chain metric has witnessed a growth over the past 12 months from 707,000 um, to 784,000 addresses holding you know, one Bitcoin or more. So it looks like there's some retail accumulation happening now uh, as we lead up to May in this having event. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. But I think there's a lot more retail investors that are coming into the space that once again are heavily affected by dramatic price swings, um, fake news and different things like that, that, you know, the, the people that have the upper hand and the metrics do tend to control. So let's see what happens. But that's what I'm seeing in the markets right now. Fascinating. Um, I'd love to figure out how to quantify that. I think the summary and what I told people in Miami is uh, they basically wanted to know what's going to happen around the halving. And my, in everyone, feel free to contradict me here. Um, and this is a great segue into our new segment, Hash It Out, with uh, Dustin Minch, um, our mining expert. Uh, so, Dustin, I'm not sure if you had anything prepared, but uh, there is a lot of talk around the having coming and what is that going to do to price. And um, what I've communicated is that what we're hearing from Wall Street is, and you know, by Wall Street I mean cumulatively everything that I, you know, am bringing in here um, is that the price is already baked in. And to Jeremy's point, if there uh, is manipulation, it's going to be to the favor of those with the information, you know, their the information, right, to the data. Um, so anyway. Uh, Let's turn it over to to Dustin. Um, Dustin, I know that you are new to the team here, uh, but you're welcome to talk about anything that relates to uh, mining metrics um, and predictions or um, insights that you can derive from there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So that the happening, um, you know, I'm kind of on the side of Jeremy. You know, I, I suspect that there's going to be kind of like a fake out like where it's going to dump a little bit everybody's going to be like what the heck you know what i mean like it didn't pump on the day of the happening or something like that because i think that there's a lot of just new investors that just expect it, it it's the day of the happening it's going to go up and i i think that you know um if i had to kind of guess um i would assume the market's probably going to be pretty boring and sideways um yeah you're, you know there's going to be some price movement with bitcoin you know six hundred dollars there $500 there, stuff like that. But I don't expect any kind of significant price changes to maybe, I would say somewhere around it. I think the halving set for May, sometime in May. Um, yep. But I don't think that we'll see any action until like June or July. 
Um, you know, I just I just want to chime in real quick because Christine, you just mentioned this, and we're still talking about the having. Um, you know, I heard some compelling cases as to why the you know the the having is not necessarily priced in that I tend to really agree with. Right. So, how many people that you speak to that are not in Bitcoin today? really even know about Bitcoin. And if they know about Bitcoin, do they know really that there's anything else above and beyond Bitcoin? Most likely not. I mean, people are no, starting to- No, the answer to... is definitely no. Right. 98% right. <laughs> of people do not know. <laughs> right, right, right. So think about it this way. If very few people have ever heard of Bitcoin or, you know, there's starting to be more adoption, people at least know the name, but they're not invested, obviously. And they don't even know that there's any coins above and beyond Bitcoin. They don't even know what a blockchain is. Do you think the people that are going to hear it on the news, it's going to be on CNBC, hey, we're at the having Bitcoin supply is about to reduce dramatically and all this stuff. And then people are using their emotions and then they're getting in. They have no idea what they're doing. Do you even think they're going to understand what the having is? Let alone, do you think any of those people know what the having even means right now? So I think there's so much money that will pour in of people that have no idea what the word having is and what that actually does to the mechanics of Bitcoin and the Bitcoin network that it's impossible for it to be priced in it's priced well, in becomes maybe for the, the people. actual that well, becomes the actual validation of like the run to 20k though i mean those are things that we should absolutely be pre-programming into the intelligence engine to look for those kind of event triggers sure so i think in in summation i think it's priced in for the people that are in the industry the hedge funds the sophisticated traders it's priced in probably for those people as of this moment but it doesn't take into account the retail traders that will come in and even the sophisticated traders that are not in yet because they just don't see the opportunity. But as soon as that FOMO kicks in, it's going to be a different game. Yeah, 100%. Um, the biggest thing that I got my eye on right now that I, that pertains to mining is, um, and I'm glad that you know Steve kind of brought it up, is Ethereum. I'm actually mining Ethereum, and it's not the... You know, if you look at right now, the uh, a lot of the mining calculators, a lot of the miners are mining Ethereum Classic, and, and in my opinion, um, you know, I would I would suspect that, you know, Ethereum Classic's probably going to dump like it's always done in the past. Um, it's not a coin that I would mine and personally hold, um, but Ethereum's been kind of my go-to, kind of like my mining safe haven, um, and it's not the most profitable coin to mine right now, but kind of in my investment strategy and how i do it is i accumulate it and essentially buy it through my electricity um so it's a little bit different than just going to like a traditional exchange um there's kind of been some controversy about the mining hardware um there's a company called inno silicon that was supposed to release an asic grin miner specific to grin coin mining and they took a bunch of people's money recently and they were supposed to release like a review batch for these YouTubers to basically do reviews on because these miners were projected to make somewhere around $150 a day. And so they were supposed to mail it to them. And at the last minute they canceled, they sent out a press release and refunded everybody's money and said that those ASIC miners aren't coming out. And so it's kind of, it's like, it's kind of like a uh, mining hardware war is going on right now. And a lot of people suspect that these ASICs have been sold off to a large mining farm in China. And so they're kind of keeping it in the inner circle. Um, the other thing is with Ethereum right now um, is that they're supposed to be switching over to ProgPow, which is the, the same hash function algorithm that Bitcoin Gold uses. And I know that we've seen a recent uh, price bump in Bitcoin Gold. A lot of the GPU miners like that to mine it for profit. And so this prog pow algorithm is supposed to kind of prevent uh, ASIC. It's, a, it's an algorithm that doesn't allow FPGAs and ASIC miners to be able to mine on that algorithm. So it's supposed to be like a safe haven for GPU miners. And so um, the next, you know, Ethereum is supposed to adopt this prog pow, but an ASIC mining company released a press release stating that they've cracked the code on ProgPow and can develop an ASIC for that. And so now Ethereum has put that on hold essentially until they can find an auditor to audit that code to make sure that the code is valid. And so um, what's interesting about that is just to find a person that's capable of unbiasedly auditing that code. It's kind of hard to find because you're going to have to find a certain type of developer that is unbiased and outside of the blockchain space, but understands all this underlying technology and code to be able to audit that. So um, 
I don't know, for some odd reason, I just found that fascinating that Ethereum's kind of got this code that they've, you know, basically have been, you know, having people develop on hold. And so I think a lot of the miners are kind of waiting for this prog pow to come out so that we, you know, us GPU miners don't have to worry about FPGA miners and ASIC miners kind of, you know, ripping out the profits out of these, out of these blockchains. And so, um, you know, the next, I think that, you know, if it was, you know, from a mining perspective, um, you know, the next six months is probably going to be pretty interesting. I think that, you know, in between that, it's going to be pretty boring. It's not going to be a significant bump in mining profits. Um, if it was one thing I could say to people that are looking into getting into mining, kind of the issue with this is it's, it's bittersweet because, you know, right now the mining hardware is so dirt cheap because mining's not as attractive as it was in, two, you know, late 2017, early 2018. So the best time to get mining hardware is right now, but it's also not the most profitable thing to do right now. So it's kind of like, you know, you have to, from an investment standpoint, you know, it makes sense to accumulate that hardware now versus later kind of thing. Because once once the profits do start kicking in, um, you're going to see the price of this, you know, the, the, the graphics cards and everything go up three to four X. And so then from a, a, an ROI investment standpoint, at that point, it doesn't make sense to pay those inflated prices, even if the profits project that. Um, so you kind of have to be careful when you invest into mining hardware that way and have to understand it. Uh, from an investment standpoint, in that article that you shared with me, Jeremy, um, they were talking about how ASIC mining hardware typically only has about an average lifespan of about a year and a half before it's considered inefficient. So I think that, you know, coming up with some kind of way to be able to project these average lifespans of these different mining hardware so that way, from an investment standpoint, people know, hey, if I buy this when it first comes out, I got a year and a half to get my money back and then sell it off in the market. In the sell market. Hey, uh, Christina, following on so, in, on this conversation, is do you want me to do that follow-up with Philip? Because yes. every, everything that's... All right, so yes. I'm going to do, so, do that today. So let me, because, let me jump in there. Let me yep. jump in there also. Um, okay, so yes, we have a lot going on in the in the mining division of Coin Genius, and we may even have like a labs division. Um, so yes, Oz, let's do that offline. Um, Dustin, I'd like to circle back with, and, and, and Oz, I totally know where your brain's going there. And yes, we absolutely want to do that. Um, but before we do that, uh, Dustin, we have, uh, lots of, uh, network and partners with other kind of think tanks. Um, my, my mind goes first to Marco over at, um, uh, Blockchain Transparency Institute. If there's a set of things, if you need a specific coder or analysis, I can reach out to the community and get you what you need. Just tell me the metrics that would actually make a difference for you to understand for your equipment when you should pivot to a different mining strategy. Um, those are the kind of insights that we're trying to extrapolate. So if you have specific items that you would hone in on, um, if you had all of the data in the world, can you tell us here a little bit about what you would look for and how that correlation turns into extra money in your pocket if you were to invest in a mining kit. Right. Yeah. Um, did you want me to elaborate on, on that kind of briefly Please. right now? And, and Oz yeah. is super, yes, here, uh, Oz is super excited. We'll deal with all of that offline and there'll be more announcements and other Genius Wednesdays later. Uh, but in terms of educating how you can make money on mining, uh, which is passive income, which a lot of people could use in their lives, can you explain that a bit and how you might leverage metrics to uh, have a more profitable strategy? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the biggest thing is, is like, I think a lot of people kind of fall to the trap, like, you know, oh, well, I got to buy the most expensive mining hardware to be able to be profitable. And there is reasons for buying more, more expensive graphics cards, especially if you're limited on space. Like if you can, if you can only plug in one mining rig and you want to get the best, you know, punch out of it, yeah, then buy more expensive graphics cards. But from a business standpoint, you really got to get the one that's kind of middle of the road priced that has a good daily profit, but also has a low power uh, consumption because your your time to ROI on that equipment is going to be lot, a lot faster than a card that costs anywhere from $800 to $1,100. So 
you this may be a to... good time for folks to like invest in solar energy and offset their <laughs> right, energy right. bills and, if you're and, looking into something like this. Yeah, and so um, which brings up my my uh, something else that I kind of had in my mind. There's a there's a there's a company called Pluton Solar, and um, I've actually ran across this. You know, talks about this company, and they're based in California, and they have a large solar farm, and somehow have negotiated with solar with the tax credits and rebates and everything. They've got their electricity cost in California down to a penny a kilowatt. Wow. And, uh, and so you're we should to... be tracking that. We should be tracking areas that you can get, you know, really cheap power where if you're interested in setting up a business around mining, that these are the areas that you should be looking at. Um, there's also a lot happening in green technology and uh, wind, solar, you know, translating trash to, you know, energy, um, new energy solutions are coming. So for those naysayers that say, oh, mining's too expensive, we're about to have an entire revolution there. So well, um, Dustin, can you talk too. a bit around, can you talk a bit around how you establish a mining strategy as well? Like for folks that like me that know nothing about mining, can you start at the 101 level and kind of educate folks? Well, yeah. I We've mean, got about five minutes left before we have to wrap up today. I mean, these days, it's pretty easy to get started. I mean, if you get like any kind of computer at home, regardless whether it has a graphics card in it or not, um, I, yeah, I even sent Jeremy this article about a new coin that I'm actually mining on my laptop called Pegnet. And, you know, it doesn't require a lot of, you know, computer power or anything like that, like Bitcoin does. Oh, I have yeah. to also plug, you can mine bad coin on a laptop. I haven't done the analysis for yeah. uh, other things that there are, like for our partners out there, I just well, have to plug them there. Um, but let, we should do an analysis on that of like, what can you mine in your spare bedroom, right? Like what, right. what can you, what can the average person get their hands on versus um, like what Oz is talking about with Philip at Bitmain, um, which is one of the largest, you know, mining um, equipment producers in the industry. Um, those are two very different animals, right? And to be able yeah. to educate people so that they understand the differences and the cost up front that's associated with that kind of thing. Um, I always like to bring it back to like, what can the 99% do for passive income strategies, right? Um, and a lot of that just requires, like, we talk about it at a very high level, but we hear it going to have to bring it down um, as well so that everyone can understand. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And it really just depends on, you know, what people's investment budget is. Um, if they just want to get into mining and just kind of get their toes in the water, uh, you know, there are some coins that I would recommend that you can just mine on the laptop now. It's not going to bring you a ton of money overnight, but the idea with that is, is that you're not using a bunch of expensive computer equipment. You're just using what you have laying around the house. It's not going to run up your electric bill. And, you know, if you mine enough of these projects, I mean, Bitcoin started out where you could mine 50 Bitcoin a day on a laptop. Now, back then it wasn't worth anything. So nobody really knew what the, the potential of Bitcoin was going to be. And so, you know, it's kind of, you know, the same you know, story with some of these newer blockchains that are coming out, you know, they kind of want to follow a similar organic path as what Bitcoin did. Um, obviously, some of these coins actually have use cases to them other than just being like a digital currency. So that makes it kind of cool, too. But um, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to put like a little guide together of, you know, just just for, you know, small time people that just want to get into mining and, you know, accumulate some of these coins through mining. Um and what's cool about it is some of these coins, you can't really buy them at an exchange yet. So, you know, as people catch on to some of these projects, there's a good chance that some of these projects may make their way all the way to Binance. And then at that point, that would be a good time to look at selling out some of those coins. And you never know. I mean, I still wholeheartedly believe that, you know, with a laptop and the right mindset and just, you know, continuing to pursue it that you could easily make, you know, a couple thousand dollars maybe off of mining some of these coins and holding them for the next, you know, maybe two to two to three years or whatever. Um, and then selling them later on as more, you know, as they become more popular and more mature. So I would love to help with that vision. Yeah. Um, I would love to help, you know, 
get, keep people apprised of the progress of these uh, tokens as they, you know, as they are, you know, in mining and they become bigger, bigger use cases, um, you know, chain, blockchain interoperability as they become listed on more and more exchanges, the legitimacy becomes, uh, you know, realer to people, you know, more tangible. Um, and I agree. I think that that would help shape people's strategies. Okay, well, we are at the top of the hour. Dustin, holy moly, thank you for Hash It Out. Like, thank you for actually teaching us about mining and bringing all of these new metrics into Coin Genius. Um, so, folks on the call here, um, I'd like to give it over to the entire roundtable uh, for last thoughts here before we wrap up. Well, uh, if nobody else is going to chime in, I'll just say, you know, that stating the obvious is a very exciting time to be in blockchain and crypto. We see adoption happening globally in so many different verticals and industries. It's just a matter of time. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Some good synopsis today. I think uh, from a price prediction standpoint and kind of like a long term, I don't ever really see it going below big major supports around like low 7Ks. And that's just my uh, theory. But I base that off the parabolic support and then the monthly view app and everything. It's lining up right now. And it, whenever it lines up, it never really goes below that. Historically, anyways, in the last three years. <clears throat> so that's my price synopsis, I guess. I think Ethereum to the moon. That's why I'm mining it. <laughs> <laughs> it's never let me down. It's always been just that reliable, trusty, dusty kind of coin for me that it's not, you know, it's not the most popular coin to mine. A lot of people despise mining it, but it just, I don't know. It just, it works for me, man. So got me I'd love to look at the sentiment of the, I'd love to look at the sentiment of the miners versus the sentiment of the traders. That would be a really interesting comparison. Yeah, it's, awesome. well, it's, even the investment awesome. so guys, are guys, so, we have, sorry. yeah, no, sorry, we actually have to wrap up and uh, and send this out. So, um, thanks everyone for joining us for Genius Wednesdays. We hope that you found it uh, insightful. Um, and if you have any questions or would like to reach out to our team, you can find us at CoinGenius.ai or reach out to us at info at CoinGenius.ai. Thanks everyone. Thank you. <laughs>